Well, great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Mike Parks here, and uh, it's um, great to have you all back. And uh, hopefully, you enjoyed that last uh, last panel. And and uh, I've got to commend our next panel moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Henry Willis, for a you know just an incredible, timely, and uh, appropriate discussion on uh, lessons from recent disasters. Un unfortunately, as many of us know. Uh, there's a Category 2 hurricane brewing right uh, in the heart of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, a couple hours out of, outside of landfall right now, uh, down in the uh, you know Panhandle. I mean, in the uh, Delta region. So uh, I don't think. Uh, hopefully, we've learned some lessons from the previous five storms that have hit uh, uh, the Louisiana coast this year. But anyway, uh, the other thing I want to say before I introduce Do Dr. Willis. Uh, and his uh, his panel. I just want to make a comment. Uh, today, October 28th, is in fact uh, National First Responders Day. So I think it's fitting that we would have a panel today on a on a topic as important as uh, disasters. When we think about, there's 4.6 million career first responders in our country, and uh, they're out there for us each and every day. And interestingly enough, I didn't know this, but the CDC reported recently that uh, almost 100 firefighters and over 150 police officers die every year in the line of duty. And obviously there's many more that are injured uh, but uh, throughout the year. But I just want to make a point that this is obviously a time as we are talking about disasters that we need to keep uh, our, our firefighters, our police officers, our EMTs and our paramedics uh, in our thoughts and prayers as they're out there truly on the front lines making a huge difference. So I just thought appropriate to mention that on October 28th, National Responders Day, First Responders Day. So with that, let me just introduce Dr. Henry Willis, who is uh, the Director of Homeland Security Operational Analysis Center um, with the RAND Corporation. Um, he is a uh, um, senior policy researcher for the RAND Corporation, as well as a professor of policy analysis at the Party RAND Graduate School. And I've got to commend him. He's got a great panel here. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, Jennifer Carpenter could have been easily on the last panel talking about waterways. And uh, Captain Smith has got more than his fair share of uh, experience dealing with disasters, certainly down the Gulf. And, and Aaron Davenport, well, you know, shipmate, I'm still looking for uh, some coffee mess dues money for you from uh, you know about 20 years ago at the Command and Ops School. So, uh, anyway, great panel assembled, and with that, I will I will turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Willis to uh, lead the way and uh, go ahead and intro his video. Dr. Willis, thank you, Mike. Look forward to the uh, the discussion today. As you said, we knew we would learn from past uh, disasters. We expected there would be future ones. We didn't know they'd be as soon as they are. Um, with that, I, I, I do think we have a good panel of, with relevant experience, and I, I think the first step is to click through our recorded uh, presentations at this time. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion of what we can learn about maritime sector resilience from disasters. The inspiration for this session came out of some of the work I've been involved in recently at the Homeland Security Operations Analysis Center, the Department of Homeland Security's FFRDC, where we've been looking at helping the department and the Coast Guard identify ways to improve the resilience of our nation's infrastructure to natural disaster. And of course, the maritime sector is an important part of that. In the recent past, discussions of resilience in the maritime sector focused on primarily two issues, natural disasters and labor strikes. However, recent events highlighted both the complexity and magnitude of the challenge. Just take, for example, the 2018 hurricane season, where Harvey Irma and Maria, Florence and Michael, all affected in different parts of our coastal infrastructure and very severely. The uh, types of effects were broad. Of course, shipping had to be rerouted, uh, and that was costly. Port operations were shut down for each of the respective ports, leading to delays, and also those 
port infrastructure had to address damage that was caused. The cruise ship industry had to deal with cancellations and of great economic impact, the oil and gas industry, whether it was refining oil platforms or drilling rigs also experienced uh, damage and delays. But when we come to resilience, the role of the maritime sector in recovery is also important. And it's an interdependent relationship. This maritime sector is useful and required to bring in supplies to sustain people. But at the same time, those people are dependent on being able to support the maritime sector in doing so and are often affected themselves by the disasters. What we also know from our planning work is that these hurricane scenarios, while they can be catastrophic, aren't the only scenarios we think about when we think about maritime sector resilience. Uh, Maersk's experience with the non Petchi attacks show the vulnerabilities of the maritime sector to cyber attacks. Yet that was a mild cyber attack compared to some of the uh, scenarios that are considered in the context of uh, cyber kinetic state attacks. We've also, as a nation, thought about the effects of electromagnetic pulse or geomagnetic storms on the position, navigation, and timing system provided by GPS and the effects that could have on the maritime sector. Or we've thought about scenarios like a New Madrid earthquake uh, and the effects it would have on the Mississippi River and the inland waterways. In many of these more catastrophic scenarios, when we run the tabletop exercises, one of the conclusions that the recovery is too hard to imagine. Yet, at the same time, recent events have shown us how bad things could be and provide an opportunity to learn lessons that could be transferred to some of these other scenarios. For example, I already mentioned Hurricane Maria. That was a case where an entire society, isolated as an island, was affected and had to recover. And now, this year, the whole nation is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that's showing us how supply chains can be disrupted and affect the maritime sector, for example, through shortages of personal protective equipment, or worker disruptions can affect the sector through, for example, uh, challenges with crew ch change outs and get, allowing new crews to come in, or over or under demand placed in the supply chain. As an example of over demand, uh, immediately after the economy started to shut down, there was an over-demand for oil storage, and that led to backups of ships on the West Coast. And we're still seeing the effects of under-demand on both commercial aviation and, and cruise ships. So that brings us to the purpose of this panel. We're here to ask the question of what can we learn from the events we're currently going through or recent catastrophic events that would help us improve resilience of the maritime sector for other catastrophes. And I'm pleased to have with us a panel of three experts from very different perspectives. Our first speaker will be my colleague Aaron Davenport. Aaron is a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. He served at, as White House Special Advisor for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, serving Vice President Ch Cheney and Biden and Executive Officer of Counter-Drug Operations, U.S. Southern Command. He retired as a senior officer in the U.S. Coast Guard, where he served at sea aboard six ships, including command of two large cutters, enforcing international drug trafficking treaties, performing cooperative security assistance, homeland security, maritime law enforcement, and joint counter-drug operations throughout the Eastern Pacific, Atlantic Caribbean, and Bering Seas. He possesses decades of experience working cooperatively with several countries addressing security operations, illegal migration, maritime law enforcement and drug interdiction, including Colombia and Central American and Caribbean nations. Aaron holds a bachelor's in maritime sciences from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and a master's in science in environmental sciences with a certificate in industrial hygiene and a minor in hazardous materials from the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He also recently served as an international expert panel member and paper presenter at the 2019 NATO Science for Peace and Security Program, Advanced Research Workshop on Counterterrorism. And today, Aaron will be sharing with us his experience 
from work he was deeply involved in in the HSOC program of research to support recovery of Hurricane Maria. Our second speaker will provide a perspective from the private sector in the shipping industry. Jennifer Carpenter serves as president and CEO of the American Waterways Operators, the National Trade Association representing the inland and coastal tugboat, towboat and barge industry. Jennifer brings 30 years of experience in this industry, joining AWO in 1990 before becoming the CEO in January of this year. She brings deep expertise in regulatory issues, government affairs, and policy analysis. And has served for 13 years as a member of the Congressionally Authorized Towing Safety Advisory Committee. Jennifer has also received two Meritorious Public Service Awards and a Public Service Commendation from the U.S. Coast Guard for her contributions to the Towing Safety Advisory Committee and the Coast Guard AWO Safety Partnership. Finally, we'll hear from a U.S. Coast Guard perspective from our panelist, Captain Jason Smith, Sector Commander of Houston Galveston. Uh, Captain Smith assumed these duties in June 12, 2020. As Sector Commander, Captain Smith serves as the Captain of the Port, Officer in Charge of Marine Inspections, Federal Maritime Security Coordinator, Coordinator and the Federal on scene Coordinator, and coordinates maritime safety and security, environmental protection, search and rescue, waterways management, and contingency planning operations for the navigable waterways from the east bank of the Colorado River in southwest Texas to 60 miles east of Lake Charles, Louisiana, and 200 miles offshore to the seaward extent of the U.S. This area of responsibility encompasses five of the nation's 20 busiest ports, including Houston, Beaumont, Lake Charles, Texas City, Port Arthur, Freeport, and Galveston. Throughout his career, Captain Smith has held numerous field and staff assignments, specializing in marine safety, security, and environmental compliance. Captain Smith is a 1996 graduate of the Maine Maritime Academy with a BS in marine transportation and a 2007 graduate of the University of Maryland's James A. James Clark School of Engineering with a master's in science in systems engineering and reliability risk engineering. Captain Smith is a certified project management professional and type one incident commander. Captain Smith's personal awards include four Coast Guard Meritorious Service Medals, four Coast Guard Commendation Medals, Military Outstanding Volunteer Service Medal, and other unit and team awards. Look forward to hearing from our three colleagues on this panel and then taking questions from the audience. It's an honor to serve on this panel. I'm going to speak briefly about the Homeland Security Operational Analysis Center's efforts to assist uh, FEMA and the government of Puerto Rico with the Puerto Rico recovery after the devastations from Hurricanes Irma and Maria in September of 2017. Specifically, I'm going to highlight some of the maritime work and how it hopefully relates uh, to resilience. First, a little background and context regarding HSOAC's work. Um, some of you may not, may not be aware, but this was a congressionally uh, mandated uh, study and report. And FEMA asked HSOAC to do a damage and needs assessment post hurricane, provide supporting documentation or the analytical foundation for the, for the report that was being drafted by HSOAC in concert with the government of Puerto Rico and FEMA. Briefly, HSOAC's approach can be summed up in four major lines of effort. Uh, collaboration with the government of Puerto Rico, obviously probably one of the most important things. During that period, as a you probably saw it unfold out in the news. There were both cultural and political uh, challenges for the government and FEMA and, and HSOAC. What we did is we looked and identified courses of action, many of them, probably a few hundred. And so we couldn't present them all. So there had to be a way to neck this down and 
decide on which ones were most important for Puerto Rico. So shifting to uh, what the what the maritime, what we did in the transportation sector, and specifically maritime, we did do a, a damage and needs assessment. And what we were looking at is a quite a few quite a few damage reports, um, interviews with port officials and government officials. And we looked, more, looked at more than just the physical condition of the port. I was particularly interested in understanding what was the nature of activity in the transportation system before, during, and after the hurricane. We really needed a baseline. And after the damage and needs assessment was completed, the courses of action naturally emerged. So what did we find regarding the damage? Interesting enough, after pouring over hundreds of, of photos and assessments, it actually emerged that many of the ports were in poor condition before the hurricane struck. And there appeared to be a lack of operational maintenance and normal upgrades that would occur. The nature of the damage, from my perspective, was caused by primarily the wind, and it was the structures on top of the piers and the facilities that were that sustained the most damage. Although there was flooding, uh, the structural issues with the piers seemed to be pre-existing. Interesting enough, and it was not readily intuitive to us, the port operations were largely restored within a very short period of time. Primarily due to the fact that Puerto Rico is focused and uh, uses the port of San Juan more than any other ports. So I think part of their ability to bounce back was there was really only one port that was taking the bulk of the uh, logistics and supplies. So to break down what we thought uh, Puerto Rico needed to recover, you can see this breakdown so you have a sense of the magnitude of the damage and what would really be needed to build resilience into their port. So how do we establish a baseline of maritime activity? Well, we were able to collaborate with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They've done some studies and other, uh, as Henry mentioned, uh, Harvey was one of them, and they've been asked to look at port activity. What they've been using, uh, one of the tools is AIS automatic identification system, which provides the location of a vessel uh, every few seconds. So what you see in these, uh, up in the upper left corner, uh, was uh, in 2016, these are all the track lines. Um, and you can see by the color, it's very interesting. Uh, the blue color, for example, would be your uh, cruise ships. You see they're all coming into the uh, north coast, and many of them are passing by. You can see the dense blue blue lines. You see a lot of orange color on the bottom, and that is tanker traffic. Um, then the yellow are, are pleasure craft. This, being able to see this and visualize the AIS data was really helpful in understanding what the traffic flow and what the maritime transportation system, uh, how it works prior to the, to the hurricanes. Another way to present this is using uh, the AIS signal density plot. And you can see it looks like uh, San Juan area up in the upper right. Uh, is super dense, so you can see the uh, reliance on that port. Now you see the little line, everybody's probably asking, what is that line over there on the right? Well, that's actually the ferry traffic between Fajardo and Vieques. 
this was quite helpful. So continuing to do the analysis, we were able to use the AIS da data and look at trends. Interesting enough, uh, the Puerto Rico was already on a decline. As you can see, as we approach the uh, September storms, the actual uh, amount of vessel entry was actually on the de decrease. And on a finer point, you see the blue line uh, going up, and that is that is San Juan. That 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 shows you that San Juan bounced back quickly and then was heavily used uh, for uh, recovery operations. You see then the uh, red and the gray lines. Uh, that's Fajardo and Vieques. That's the ferry traffic, um, and you see that came back and then bounced uh, back up here. And then um, uh, Saiba, Siba, which is the old Roosevelt Roads down here, and uh, Ponce later were being utilized uh, for recovery operations. So the AIS uh, data was very helpful in understanding what was going on in Puerto Rico before, during, and, and after the hurricanes. So this is an overview of the transportation sector's courses of action. So you can see where the ports fall out. Uh, interesting enough here, uh, there's a six total uh, courses of action, but five could arguably be attributed to, to resilience. This I just want to sh illustrate how the damage and needs assessments is related to the courses of action how the crosswalk from needs to courses of action. A few examples, uh, port ownership. Uh, we experience uh, a, a fair amount of complexity uh, collaborating and understanding how the ports are managed and governed. There were actually a very large number of uh, port owners and arrangements uh, that made it more complicated. And so one of the co is, is to consolidate the port ownership. Uh, also, there was a obviously a heavy reliance on San Juan, that, and San Juan is much more developed than the other ports around the island. So developing some more redundant port capacity uh, we thought was uh, needed to build resiliency into their MTS. Uh, also, um, on the southern side, uh, there's a large port. It's uh, Puerto Rico's uh, deep water port, Ponce, that um, is underdeveloped and doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't at capacity. So one of the things was to, to increase uh, Ponce's capacity, and that would build uh, resilience into the system. So a quick overview of the courses of action. Again, redundant seaport capacity. You saw on the AIS uh, that they actually did start to use some of the other ports because uh, San Juan was um, San Juan still had to operate to get food and uh, needed supplies to keep the island running, but the actual recovery operations, they needed to swing out to, uh, to the southern part, Ponce, and out to uh, Siba, which was the previous uh, um, military facility. So it had uh, piers and structures that could support uh, the recovery operations. We also saw that asset management is very important, something that uh, we think could benefit uh, Puerto Rico in the future. Uh, obviously, the biggest thing is to repair the report for the ports and then start to look at ways to build in uh, upgrades and resiliency. Another one is to look at the transportation system recovery plan, uh, incorporating lessons learned from this disaster. And again, 
uh, one of the ways, and, and Puerto Rico is in a good position because of their location in the Caribbean and the deep in the deep port that they have, they could essentially become a transit shipment hub over time if they were to make the investment in Ponce. And again, port ownership, consolidating the port ownership, we thought was a, a needed course of action. So to wrap this up, I wanted to show you the uh, actual estimates broken down, and it's approximately a billion dollars to restore the Puerto Rico ports to full functionality, and another half a billion dollars to upgrade them and 400 million to provide some new capacity in the port. And specifically, uh, the last one is to look at uh, enhanced planning and governance of the ports. So in conclusion, we found that the MTS for an island economy is so very important. And we found that AIS data, position data on all the ships coming and going, were provided a extremely valuable tool in, in examining how the MTS could recover and how we could potentially see uh, resilience. And we have a, a report that's available. If you're interested, it provides all the supporting documentation for the transportation uh, sector. And now I'm uh, free to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be part of today's program and to share some perspective on how we can preserve and strengthen the resilience of the marine transportation system. This is an important topic because maritime commerce is critical to the U.S. economy, to our national and homeland security, and to our natural environment and quality of life. It's also timely as our ongoing experience with COVID provides an opportunity to assess what's working well and what needs to be improved to strengthen our resilience for the future. I want to start with a positive message, not only because I think we can all use some good news right now, but also because it has the virtue of being true. And that is operationally, the domestic maritime industry has proven resilient in the face of this pandemic. From the acute stage of the crisis this spring through the chronic stage that we're in now, Mariners have continued to report to work. Vessels have continued to operate without missing much of a beat. Barges and towing vessels have continued to deliver the building blocks of the American economy, along with products that have never been more important, like raw materials for PPE, chemicals to make hand sanitizer, paper products for all of those delivery boxes. And they've been able to do that with very low rates of COVID-19 infection among the Mariner workforce. I attribute that resilience to three things. First, our industry's historic experience with contingency planning, safety management systems, and crisis management. That experience provided a solid foundation for vessel operators to build on in adapting policies, procedures, and operations to address this public health emergency. It's been a different challenge than a hurricane, which you can see coming and which has a clear beginning and end and doesn't last nearly as long. But the same thought processes and ways of working have served us well here. The second success factor was companies early realization that the key to keeping vessels operating and commerce moving is keeping mariners who are the linchpin of their operations healthy and safe companies quickly put in place and have continued to refine procedures to do that. Pre-screening crew members prior to leaving home and prior to boarding vessels, often in conjunction with telehealth providers. 
modifying crew change procedures to minimize exposure during travel to vessels and avoid large groups congregating on crew change days, minimizing contact between crew members and non-crew members, and more stringent vessel cleaning and decontamination procedures. For their part, mariners have taken seriously their status as essential workers and taken steps to safeguard their health while off duty. And the result of these concerted and cooperative efforts has been to keep COVID-19 infections among the domestic maritime workforce to a minimum. The third success factor that I'll highlight is government industry communication and timely implementation of practical policies that complemented the steps industry was taking to keep vessels operating and mariners healthy and working. The early designation of maritime operations as an essential critical infrastructure sector by the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency was hugely important. We could have had a total breakdown in the maritime supply chain this spring as states and localities imposed a patchwork of stay at home orders. We didn't. The CISA guidance amplified by Coast Guard guidance was referenced or reflected in many state and local orders. AWO and maritime companies developed template letters to identify maritime workers so that they could continue to cross state lines and report to work. Where we have the potential for massive disruption like Texas restrictions on people traveling by air or road from Louisiana, we were able to work through it in a timely way. Similarly, the Coast Guard as our industry's primary regulator has been proactive and cooperative in working with industry to meet regulatory objectives while reducing health and safety risks. They listened and they adapted their own policies, procedures and requirements extending the validity of merchant mariner credentials and medical certificates, allowing use of remote inspection techniques, extending deadlines for installation of complex and expensive ballast water management systems. That cooperation has been essential to keeping the domestic maritime supply chain moving efficiently, safely and securely, even as the industry has grappled with the economic shock of demand degradation in almost every sector. So what have we learned from this experience to date? What does it suggest for future actions that we need to take to strengthen the resilience of the marine transportation system? My first observation is that this experience reinforces the importance of robust support from policymakers for the four pillars that undergird a healthy domestic maritime transportation industry under normal circumstances. So first, the Jones Act, which ensures that vessels moving cargo between US points are owned, built and crewed by Americans. Both the pandemic and the prevailing geopolitical situation underscore what a bad idea it would be to relinquish control of our domestic maritime supply chain to foreign companies and foreign man mariners who may be subsidized or controlled by a strategic adversary or competitor. Second, a modern, well-maintained ports and waterways infrastructure. We need to increase investment in locks, dams, harbor maintenance and dredging, build the next generation of Coast Guard buoy tenders and ensure the funding to keep them operating. So just as we couldn't afford disruption in the flow of vital maritime commerce due to the pandemic, we can't afford to have waterways closed and vessels stopped due to lack of dredging or buoys off station. High water, low water, lock, dam, vessel maintenance, these are all foreseeable situations and we need a more strategic planned approach to dealing with them. Third, uniform laws and regulations governing maritime transportation, the importance of which was underscored by our industry's experience with COVID. Timely federal leadership prevented a patchwork of state and local stay at home orders from interrupting the maritime supply chain this spring. Federal leadership is also needed to make sure that a patchwork of state laws and regulations established for other reasons, safety, environmental, or what have you, don't disrupt the efficient flow of vital maritime commerce. 
And fourth, safety. That requires continued industry leadership to avoid unforced errors that hurt people, the environment, or property, and impact the bottom line and the reliability of the system. It also requires even-handed and proactive Coast Guard enforcement so that everyone is following the same rules. CISA was right. The maritime transportation industry is an essential critical infrastructure sector, and we need to be continually attentive to the pillars that ensure its health and efficiency in normal times to ensure its resilience in times of crisis. Sometimes policymakers are better at focusing on crises than ordinary time, and that needs to change. What other steps can we take, drawing on our experience with COVID to strengthen the resilience of the marine transportation system? Again, I'll offer four. First, companies can include pandemic and public health emergency planning in their safety management systems and use procedures implemented during this crisis to deal with ordinary health risks like flu season. In consultation with industry, government can work to ensure effective and efficient mechanisms to ensure prioritized access to testing, PPE, and vaccines to frontline maritime workers. Second, government and industry can work together to strengthen the cyber systems that have made remote work possible and enabled it to work as well as it has in the time of COVID. If ever we needed a reminder of the need to guard against cyber threats from malicious actors or cyber breakdowns because of insufficiently robust systems and procedures, our experience this year has made that clear. Third, industry in, cons in consultation with industry and with support from Congress when needed, the Coast Guard and other regulatory agencies can ensure that they have the authorities that they need to adapt policies, procedures, and requirements to deal with emergency situations and to enable continuing use of practices that have reduced health and safety risks during the pandemic and could improve efficiency and resilience going forward. And fourth, industry, government, academia, and other experts should actively dialogue about the lessons of this experience as we're doing today with an eye toward improving communication channels, preparing for future emergencies, and strengthening resilience. I'll end with a final thought. As we reflect on and apply the lessons of this experience to strengthen the resilience of the maritime transportation system, our goal shouldn't be how do we get back to normal, but how do we move forward to better? I am excited about being part of that conversation and working with you to make it happen. Thanks so much for having me here today. Well, thank you, Henry, for that kind introduction and also for the invitation to uh, virtually attend this 2020 Maritime Risk Symposium. So I am uh, Captain Jason Smith. I'm the sector commander for Sector Houston Galveston. Uh, and from a Coast Guard standpoint, as the cap in the port, and um, there are certainly many missions that we support uh, to keep the 360 ports th around the country uh, safe, secure, clean, and efficient. Uh, supporting these missions uh, include anything from uh, maritime law enforcement to pollution response, uh, from disaster planning to drug interdiction, AIDS navigation, and search and rescue. And uh, let me first by starting that we certainly don't do that alone, and it takes uh, a maritime village uh, to accomplish this. Uh, and it includes our, our federal and our state and our local partners, uh, industry, and the public as well. So, and while uh, these titles or the terms of these missions might uh, differ slightly uh, from agency to agency, uh, there's no question at all uh, that we all have the same goal, and that's to keep, as I mentioned earlier, our waterways safe, secure, clean, while ensuring that we have an efficient and viable maritime transportation system. Uh, so there's no question uh, that we uh, we do all of these uh, missions here at Sector Houston Galveston. It's an area that encompasses five of the nation's top 20 ports, uh, including Houston, uh, Beaumont, Lake Charles, uh, Texas City, and Port Arthur. Uh, and our true success uh, collectively, not just from here in, in Houston, but from around the country, uh, and our, su our success as a maritime community uh, comes from how we perform uh, three aspects of every mission. Uh, every day that we do these missions, uh, from the routine missions to the ones in the career missions. And at least in my perspective, uh, these, uh, there are these three aspects are how we as a maritime community 
uh, analyze and prepare for risks, um, how we respond to risks uh, that, that, that become an event, and then also, and probably most pertinent today to today's panel, is how we recover uh, from these events. So it is this last one that we are here to discuss, uh, the ability for us to be resilient. And when I think of this term, uh, there are really two pieces uh, to measuring our resiliency. Uh, and that's first, how long it takes to recover, and also how close we eventually come to full, recover, full, full recovery once we do get there. So I'd like to um, uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, some uh, events in the maritime community. Uh, no question at all, both nationally and globally, uh, we've been put to the test uh, around the world, around the country, uh, with uh, many re major re real world events, uh, events such as uh, pan pandemics and uh, historic uh, hurricane seasons, uh, environmental disasters and uh, external attacks, both physical and uh, cyber. Uh, here in North Texas, uh, we have had the, the opportunity, and I'll say that in quotes because sometimes uh, we don't consider them opportunities, but to respond uh, to events that are touching on all of those missions, all those topics that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, these opportunities or these events are um, type one incidences. In the past year alone, we have had over 180 days um, out of this last 12 months uh, within some kind of incident command structure. I'll mention just a few of them. Uh, the second 80s fire, which was a, a 64 hour fire that damaged 13 tanks of a, a particular facility here in Houston uh, with a release of over 3.3 uh, million, gallon, million gallons of petroleum products. Uh, that, res that response took 160 person incident management team and it closed the port of Houston for more than two days. Uh, additionally, the Greenpeace protesters uh, that suspended themselves off the Fred Hartman Bridge ahead of the Democratic National Convention, uh, coordinating uh, uh, 15 different law enforcement uh, vessels and over 225 officers from various law enforcement agencies. And that also uh, closed the port of Houston for, for two days. Uh, a recent collision between a gas carrier and a uh, tug pushing a loaded tank barge uh, with the release of over 10,000 barrels of, of petroleum products uh, and, the, and the need for us to uh, deploy over 20,000 um, uh, feet of boom uh, and stand up an incident management team with over 400 personnel. And that's not even including just the last couple of months uh, with particularly here in the Texas area, uh, Hurricane Laura, Hurricane uh, Beta, Hurricane Delta, and the dev devastation that's, uh, that, that's created uh, specifically within the Golden Triangle uh, up in the Lake Charles area. And we've stood up three incident management teams to support those heavy weather events. And then that's not even mentioning uh, the COVID pandemic. And, and we have also stood up an incident management team uh, to support that as well. So throughout all of these major events, uh, there are certainly common threads when it comes to evaluating our resiliency and how we recover. Uh, and for full disclosure, I really can't speak um, to some of them because we're still either in the response or in the recovery stage. So in some respects, I'm speculating on what some of these lessons learned uh, will be since we have not formally evaluated them. So kind of uh, to my, my point is that there are common threads that can be bucketed into uh, three categories. Um, how resilient the port community is to returning uh, to normal or a new normal and how the Coast Guard operations are in returning to a normal or a new normal, and then also how resilient our personnel are in returning to a normal or a new normal. And that bucket is very similar to a uh, mental resiliency. So I'll start with that first one, and that being the port resiliency and how we restore maritime commerce. Uh, there's a few comments to make and maybe some lessons learned that we've evaluated uh, for port resiliency. How has the individual uh, commercial vessels and commercial communities made their physical space resilient, uh, either from an engineering standpoint um, or from a process standpoint? Uh, for the, uh, th those that plan to be most resilient early on certainly succeed, and those that stand by and wait for, for other entities to drive them uh, to be resilient, such as taking a minimum action uh, ahead of Coast Guard closing a port 
uh, those entities uh, are the ones that we often see that fail. And they not only fail in their own operations, but they fail by creating obstructions or challenges uh, for the entire port community to have to deal with. So another point to make is how have we, looking internally as a Coast Guard, under understood the needs of the industry? And this really comes down to, uh, to communication. Uh, what do we have in place to, to receive, to process, and to push out information? Uh, here in Houston, uh, during major events, we have three best practices, some of which are not um, uh, you know, owned by Houston uh, and, and used nationally, others are. Uh, so the first one is one that we see uh, in this area, uh, and that's uh, at the sign of a major event, we stand up what we call a port coordination team. Uh, to call that uh, articulates the risk and, uh, and, and has on their uh, pre-designated maritime stakeholders uh, who are representing many uh, aspects of the industry within the port. Uh, and we listen uh, to those representatives and the challenges that they have um, with the results of the actual event that's either proposed or ongoing. Another tool that we use that's more of a national tool is the maritime transportation uh, safety recovery uh, units, and you may have heard of them before, uh, or, M or MTSRUs. Um, this is a lesson learned from Katrina, and what we do is very similar to the port coordination teams, is, is we embed maritime stakeholders into the response team to restore the port. And lastly, um, from a communication standpoint or from an understanding the industry standpoint, is uh, throughout the Coast Guard, we use a program uh, called CART, or it's a common access reporting tool to articulate the information that I just mentioned from uh, port coordination teams and MITRUs, as well as harbor patrols that we might do internally and liaisons or agency representatives uh, to other incident command posts. And, and this tool allows us to analyze uh, port-wide impacts uh, into the system and also provide for situational awareness locally at the local commander's level, as well as pushing up that same situational awareness or that common situational awareness to senior levels of our organization. And the last point to make from a port recovery standpoint is the pre-deployment of resources uh, well ahead or soon as an event is known. Uh, the captain of the port is working to request, and in some cases our senior leadership is even pushing resources um, uh, such as an incident management team, uh, forward deployed aircraft, and also cutters, uh, small, uh, large boats, small boats, uh, response boats, uh, in establishing uh, forward operating bases uh, and linking our support network, whether that's the, our, our, our NOAA scientific support coordinators, uh, our Army Corps of Engineers port resiliency teams, uh, port recovery teams, uh, strike teams, uh, internal uh, uh, naval engineering uh, salvage teams, um, all to have the resources at hand uh, during the event. So the last category, the second category I want to bring up is uh, unit resiliency, and that's internal to the Coast Guard. And some of the uh, kind of lessons learned, or at least observations that I might mention, might come as a surprise. But the first one is, in order to have unit resiliency, it's important to, um, in some cases, shut down the unit, in particular units or particular assets, uh, particularly when uh, taking shelter during during the impact. Uh, like I mentioned, this is. Uh, Probably not what you would think, but in some cases where we exceed our limitations, it is certainly best that we uh, preserve those assets uh, for the time that they're needed. And that's not always just for heavy weather uh, in preparation for hurricane, but sometimes if our assets are in uh, any kind of a hot zone of an environmental or security incident, uh, the, the importance of, of taking them out of that danger is, is certainly critical. Um, also, immediate activation of damage assessment teams uh, to assess damage to our assets and our facilities, and also right behind them is uh, repair teams, so that after the event, that if there is any damage to our units, to our assets, uh, that we can make those emergency repairs as quickly as possible and get our operations um, operational again. Uh, so similar to the pre-deployment of the operational assets, as I mentioned earlier, under port recovery, uh, these facility asset, uh, these facility and asset assessments and repair teams are, are forward deployed and are en route as soon as, as we know that an event is going to occur.
And then the last category I'd like to chat about really quickly is personnel uh, re re resiliency. And uh, that one's re really important in some, some, one category that we may often overlook. Um, early preparation and expectation setting to our personnel is critical, and whether that's in the Coast Guard or outside the Coast Guard. Uh, ensuring that our members at work uh, and, per and perform the mission have a plan on the home front uh, that our members, un, uh, that our members' dependents or the families uh, know that that those members are first responders and will likely not be there during an event. Uh, in setting up uh, those dependents with the resources that they would need without their, in our case, active duty or reserve members uh, uh, out on the front line. Uh, and they may in include information sharing from the organization, uh, utilizing a unit uh, uh, ombudsman or a, um, or a co company ombudsman to communicate with those dependents, uh, accountability so we know where they're, all, where, where they're at, any challenges that they're having, establishing a people cell within our incident management team uh, to uh, assess our members' uh, needs and, uh, and, and difficulties. And then also other types of assessment teams to support members, both logistically and financially and, and even, even legally. And all that is also forward deployed to make sure that it's there when our members and, our, and their dependents need it. Also from a personnel standpoint, personnel resili resiliency, resiliency standpoint, having the prearranged uh, plans and organizational structures with built-in relief. And I say that from a um, uh, a um, readiness standpoint, a personnel readiness standpoint, having both a layered approach to our personnel, uh, kind of like a firehouse model with a uh, first, second, or third alarm incident, because we don't always need an entire team to deal with a, a smaller event. Uh, compartmentalizing that team into the members that you need is critical. And also identifying an alternate team for those larger incidences with a port and starboard or an, alter, an, an on and off team to ensure that there's readiness. Uh, well ahead of the incident, uh, ensuring that there is uh, a training plan in place to qualify personnel uh, in these positions, and also including um, in that training plan uh, information sharing, uh, accountability, um, and also that these qualifications are being met uh, and our members are ready when, when an event occurs. And then the last um, uh, uh, kind of topic uh, observation within that category is uh, incident stress response programs. Uh, we call it um, uh, CISM here in the Coast Guard, but uh, providing that mental health support uh, and services to help individuals to um, uh, to uh, 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 to help individuals that are exposed to traumatic events. Uh, even just high stress events where you may not think you need that service, having them there is often uh, the right choice, choice to make. Uh, to identify and, and cope uh, with the response to the events and also it's, I mean, you, you could consider this kind of uh, psychological uh, first aid in, in order to minimize the harmful effects of the stress of the job, uh, particularly in crisis management situations. Uh, so if we left those challenges uh, unaddressed, uh, that stress would certainly impact the members themselves in the unit's long-term success and readiness. So those are a few lessons learned from incidences that, that we've experienced here in Houston um, uh, that, I, that I think is most critical uh, as we uh, work to become more resilient in the port community. And there's no question at all that uh, resiliency is the key in preparing uh, for the readiness of, of future operations. So that's all I have. I'll st stand by to answer any questions once we open it up to, to comments from the audience. Well, that was absolutely an uh, excellent set of comments. Um, I have a couple questions queued up, and that'll allow you all to uh, uh, think and uh, of your questions. You can either uh, raise your hands or post them in the meeting chat. I'll be I'll be checking both of them, and I'd ask uh, if our other speakers could uh, put themselves on camera as well, so then we they speak, they show up. That that would be excellent. Um, I'll pose one first question uh, and and bounce back and forth between the questions I have and those that are asked in the audience. Uh, the first question I'll pose is. 
uh, slightly different to our different colleagues here, but what are the biggest questions you think, uh, this will be for Jennifer, that, that the private sector, local and state uh, actors and sectors have for the Coast Guard, DHS, and federal government about improving resilience in the maritime sector, the questions they'd like the government to answer. And flipping back for Captain Smith, what are the biggest questions the Coast Guard has for the private sector and the local state actors about improving resilience, since we know communication is, is so uh, key in this and heard it in your remarks? Well, thanks, Henry. Um, I'll take a I'll take a shot at that from an industry perspective. So, as I said in my prepared remarks, you know, a national scale disaster like COVID needs federal leadership. And I talked about how important the DHS CISA guidance was early on. Um, and so I think a, a private sector uh, perspective question for DHS, for Coast Guard is for, uh, you know, different kinds of incidents, disasters that require working among a diversity of federal agencies, various levels of state, local jurisdictions. Who's got the lead? How do the players work together? What do you all see as impediments or things that need to be worked through? Uh, we heard a number of times in the early days of COVID uh, from the Coast Guard when uh, vessel owners would ask, what do I do in the case of uh, a COVID case on board my vessel. I've got a plan here, but how do I know that that plan is going to be acceptable? And we heard from the Coast Guard on multiple occasions, we don't make public health policy. We operation, CDC makes public health policy and we operationalize it in the maritime sector. And companies kind of said, okay, I got that. So what do I do if I have a COVID? You know, this is my plan. Is that okay? So kind of the uh, how do all those moving parts work together? What can we do to pre-grease the skids and set clear expectations? If you, you know, if do you lack authorities that you need? Um, is there statutory authority? Um, is there uh, are there things that need to be set forth in memorandums of agreement or that kind of thing that we can put in place now so that they're ready for next time? I would be really interested in uh, you know kind of. Uh, further thought on that from uh, the folks in the federal and state governments who've lived through this experience. That's an excellent response. Uh, and as we know, a big part of this event is to tee up questions for further analysis and research, and I think you gave us some thoughts there. Um, Captain Smith or Aaron, do you want to add on to any of that? Okay, right, Henry, I'll, I'll take a quick shot at it. I mean, I think uh, the, the question we have for industry is what can we do uh, to be better, to better serve the industry? Wh what can, uh, can we do to ensure that proactive measures are taken by industry, uh, that we don't um, kind of li limit um, uh, the, the, f the freedom of industry to actually um, prepare themselves? Um, yet, as, as Jennifer mentioned, ensuring that there's some level of consistency, some level of expectations that are set as well. It's kind of a tough balance. Uh, you don't want to confine industry into one course of action when it may not work well for either that particular industry or, or that particular company, uh, yet at the same time ensure that, that we're all working on the same goal, and that is to prepare the industry uh, for these types of black swan events uh, so that uh, everyone is, is safe, uh, secure. And, uh, and we're ensuring uh, that, not, that not only the um, uh, environment is clean, but overall, the overarching is that we can uh, minimize any kind of impacts to, to maritime commerce. Excellent. Definitely the communication and collaboration is needed there. Aaron, do you want to add anything or should I go to the next question? Sure. Uh, just from the perspective of the uh, Puerto Rico hurricanes, uh, I thought that the uh, those in the know or the federal government state could assist the uh, local and and uh, city and municipalities with governance models that are efficient uh, before uh, before disaster hits. Also, uh, helping them with economic sustainability measures uh, in the event of these disasters. We know they're going to continue to happen, and they may be more severe as time goes on. So what type of government structure or community or municipality structure is most efficient in, in these uh, events? I, I, I think the government knows from, from uh, a lot of experience. Um, 
The other thing is monitoring, tracking infrastructure conditions uh, uh, throughout the life of a, of a port um, and making sure that's forefront. Uh, that's what really stymied uh, a recovery and resiliency in, in Puerto Rico. Um, and then lastly, uh, how does, after all this is done and people, uh, you identify uh, the shortcomings, how does a port or community get the resources and aid for resiliency pro projects like raising piers, backup power, wind tolerance structures? Can we provide a grant or, or a, low, uh, a loan uh, structure for them? Those are my comments. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we've got some questions queuing up in the in the chat, so I'm going to start running through some of those. Uh, the first from um, Christelle Franz. Uh, this is focused on natural disasters. Uh, how can we weatherize our ports along the coastlines from natural disasters? And and I'm going to throw in a twist on this now and in the future. Uh, and I open that one up to, to the panelists. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick shot at it. I mean, certainly there is the, uh, the, the most uh, costly, and that's uh, um, uh, down, in, in, down here in Houston, there's the, the discussion of creating an actual dike to prevent uh, storm surge from impacting the maritime community. Um, uh, certainly that comes with a lot of cost, and I know the Army Corps of Engineers working closely uh, with the maritime community to see if that's even viable, um, multiple, multiple billions of dollars. Uh, so that would be the most costly option. Uh, uh, and then the least costly option, or at least um, the, the most uh, viable option, um, is, is making sure that the maritime community is prepared. Uh, we talk about the word resiliency, and um, often uh, you can consider resiliency as really preparation with hindsight. You have that hindsight, you can pick that as an example. Hopefully that'll allow us to prepare our way outside of any um, unexpected uh, uh, consequences. Thank you, uh, Kevin Smith. Any other follow-ons to that? Sure, I'm glad to uh, comment. I, I, another one through the lens of the Puerto Rico recovery. Um, the use of non-traditional ports or relieving the pressure upon primary ports um, I, I, you know, uh, as a captain of the port, I'm, I'm sure Captain Smith has, you know, the, 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 his port is the most important. Um, but there may be ports that are close by that have the capacity to be relied upon uh, during during a, um, uh, a major disaster. Uh, the use of non-traditional vessels, uh, we saw that in, in Puerto Rico, repurposing ferries, deck barges, car carriers, even recreational vessels. You've got to use what you have in your uh, area of responsibility and be creative uh, with your response plans. Uh, there's also a lot out there about the use of transshipment strategies within uh, you know, like an island nation. So you can get critical supplies. If you can get them to one port, which we saw in, in, in Puerto Rico's case, they were able to get it to San Juan. But, you know, to try to get that over land or, or in the air uh, is extremely limiting because uh, the land infrastructure was uh, just as hard, if not harder hit. Uh, so using uh, transshipment strategies uh, from one port to another uh, could be used, especially in the, this uh, the example of an island uh, island nation or uh, an island uh, community. Thank you. Excellent points, Aaron. Um, Christelle had other questions, but I want I'm gonna I want everyone to get some questions. So I'm gonna go to some other ones, and it, as time allows, we'll come back because there were some really interesting questions uh, that were put out. The next question is from John Hummel, um, suggesting that a takeaway message from the meeting is that resilience comes at a cost. Uh, how, what opportunities suggest, how do we make the argument to our nation's leaders that these investments are critical, even during the period of economic stress like we're facing now? Yeah, I'm happy to take a crack at that. And 
you know, Aaron, I think you said in your prepared remarks uh, that the poor condition of infrastructure in Puerto Rico before Maria became uh, a challenge uh, to resilience in the aftermath of the hurricane. And I think that that dovetails with one of the points that I wanted to make, which is we can't just think about resilience, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the disaster. We have to build a, a resilient system, and that includes the physical infrastructure and the human infrastructure and the policies and procedures and uh, ways of working together that support that so that it will support us in ordinary time and so that it will be there for us um, and uh, and able to be able to be put back together that much more quickly in the event of a disaster. So I think, uh, you know, to, to Mr. Hummel's question, it's not just a matter of, you know, asking for the federal assistance now. It's uh, really making sure that we have a sustained commitment, uh, you know, from lawmakers to robust funding for the Coast Guard, for the Army Corps of Engineers, for all of the things that enable the system to work. Now, the good news is while, you know, this resilience comes with a cost, I think it is just unarguably an investment. You know, the benefits will far outseed the cost and, uh, you know, the cost of not doing it can be can be truly catastrophic. So I think we've got some great stuff to work with there um, and we need a sustained effort to tell that story before we get to the point where, you know, we're risking a critical failure to a piece of infrastructure or we're ill-prepared for, uh, for something that might be around the bend. That's it. Those are some great points. Um, I just gonna. I, I want to let the other panelists chime in on that, but I want to add a couple perspectives to that. In addition, so one thing you made the point is that investing in this infrastructure now has payoffs in the future, and I think that's that makes sense. And actually, markets know how to price that in, and that's why you can you can float bonds on infrastructure investments, for example. But even with that, we have choices, right? If, if you're gonna build port infrastructure somewhere, what flood depth do you protect it to? And the higher a level we put on that could increase resilience, but increase cost, and it's uncertain when or what the payback will be on that. There have been people who have been, I, I had been in discussions five, six years ago where there were statements saying maybe all federal infrastructure should be planned to uh, uh, RCP 8.5 on, on climate change and set a federal standard on that that could then would set costs and drives, drive uh, development. Another approach I've seen taken is, can you create a resilience dividend on some of that future benefits and monetize it and price it into the bonds? Um, I'd be curious, uh, as others, either for your response, Jennifer, or others, have, have you seen any of those types of efforts of longer term resilience be discussed in industry or in the port settings. Specifically on uh, on the on the bonds, I do think that uh, you know your point of uh, needing to make you know a really a thoughtful analysis of the level of resilience that you know we need to kind of plan and pay for. We need a lot more than we got. I think that I would, you know, sort of say that about the physical infrastructure. If you look across the system, you know, we see aged Coast Guard buoy tenders. We see uh, locks that have vastly exceeded their design life. So we absolutely need to do, you know, a better job of planning to either recapitalize or, uh, you know, make more robust the resilience that we've got. Do we build for the 500-year flood or the 100-year flood? I think that's a great question for you and, you know, the other researchers here to really kind of uh, to grapple with. Um, but uh, we absolutely have to do more than we need to, and we're going to have to weigh those costs and benefits. I take part of your answer to say, I'm not worried about tomorrow, I'm worried about today. There's plenty of needs now. Uh, so that's a, a good point. Uh, Aaron or, or Catherine Smith, do you want to respond to this topic, or should I move on to another one? Uh, sure, sure, but uh, Captain Smith, did you want to? I, I'm doing a lot of talking here. Yeah, I, um, I, I think both uh, Henry and Jennifer had some really good points. I think the the, the, 
the cost to prepare is in itself the incentive to to, to preparation. Uh, I certainly can't speak to to bonds or any kind of uh, kind of uh, fi financial implications for vessels and facilities that don't do proper preparation. But certainly, the, the, those concepts uh, could be explored as well. Thanks. Uh, Henry, I just had one thing to add, and, and, and maybe it's a bit controversial, but uh, smart regulation paired with uh, either permitting or insurance, where there is an incentive to uh, to do better with disaster response, um, almost like I, I feel our regulations need to be looked, tweaked, and now refocused on what the largest risk is now. Um, every, uh, every disaster then comes usually with some kind of correction afterwards, uh, oftentimes regulation. Well, I think we can, uh, I opinion again, we can loosen some regulations in some areas and come up with new regulation to respond to uh, particularly this disaster, uh, these disasters. Uh, one example, and, and maybe some would argue it's not a good one, but uh, I'm showing my age, but you go back to uh, a hurricane that really surprised Southern Florida and Andrew and what it did to the insurance industry and building code. And what it did was make the entire area much more resilient. Um, people will argue, yeah, the cost went up, insurance went up. But in the end, uh, you know, I lived down there through five hurricanes, and uh, I didn't sustain any major damage. Uh, and part of it's because of, of the uh, building uh, floodplain and the uh, building regulations. Uh, um, so, just a point. That's, that's a good point. In the context of smart regulations, I know from my interactions with the Coast Guard over the last several months, there's been, in the short term, kind of special actions to change rules or, or relax rules or adjust rules as needed for COVID that the Coast Guard is, has put in place to to compensate given the situation at the time with an understanding that when the time is right, it'll be changed back. But that's an example of some of this flexible regulation, I think, as well. Um, any responses to any of that? Or we can, there are other questions in the queue as well. No, Henry, I think, I think one, one aspect that you're referring to is potentially, uh, uh, yeah, maximizing the, the flexibility in the regulations as well as utilizing uh, risk-based um, approaches to uh, best utilizing our resources, particularly when they're when they're limited, and whether they're limited because of a national pandemic or or they're limited because of a hurricane uh, response or any kind of response. That's, that's excellent, excellent point. And I think there's Henry, a just... research question in here of as we can collect some examples of those measures and flexibility, those changes that were made across ports this year, maybe even across the world this year and see, you know, what were how did they benefit and what were the costs of them? Uh, Jennifer? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add, you know, I really appreciate, as I said in my prepared comments, um, you know, the Coast Guard's uh, proactive and creative use of the flexibility that you've got under uh, existing statutory authority to uh, to help industry keep mariners safe. I would encourage, you know, as we, uh, you know, as we return to a eventually to a post COVID period that we not start with the premise, okay, we did that for COVID and now COVID's over or when COVID's over, we're gonna go back to the way it was before. Well, let's take an example. If we used successfully incorporated some remote inspection techniques as part, you know, not as a substitute for uh, in-person audit inspection altogether, but as a supplement or a part of an overall inspection program, uh, let's look at how that might, you know, be used, be incorporated into the regulatory program going forward. You know, not just this is something we use this one time and we'll, you know, put it away until the next crisis. How can it be incorporated? Can we use it to uh, help us use resources better um, and do things safely um, and efficiently in ordinary time? Thank you, excellent. Let me take another couple questions here because there's some interesting ones. This is from Finette Sadusky. Um, Hope I got that right, Nanette. I'm sorry if I uh, I, I mispronounced that. Uh, 
The question is, are there ways to leverage the COVID-19 working group of the U.S. Committee on Maritime Transportation System? I, I guess first I'd like someone to tell the rest of us who may not be aware what, what this committee is. So either Nanette, maybe you could tell us about that and then we can uh, have the, the uh, panelists respond. Sure, yes, good, good afternoon, how are you? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so CMTS is a cabinet level interagency uh, working group that's currently being chaired by the Coast Guard. And one of the accomplishments um, this year was they expanded their working groups to include a specific group focused on uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And it draws from their Maritime Resilience Group and also their Maritime Innovative Science and Technology Group. And the advantage of this um, high-level, uh, kind of two-star level, um, GOFOs and senior government people is they produce assessments and reports that go to uh, Congress and the government. So they're congressionally... Um, mandated and stood up and they're executed by the ex executive branch. I am aware they were uh, mentioned earlier this morning, but what what isn't very well known um, is the fact that now they're also have a focus area specifically for COVID and pandemic. Thank you. Well, thank you for raising that. Uh, I've learned something today. I didn't know about that, but any of the panelists, uh uh, already aware or have ideas hearing that? If not, we all learned something today and we'll have to think about how to, uh, <laughs> that might go in that category. Um, yeah, I wasn't aware, Nanette, and uh, you know, I, I say that not to uh, in any way disparage the group, but really to say, I think you've just helped us identify a challenge. Here is apparently a resource with some significant horsepower behind it that I'm embarrassed to admit I didn't know was there. And you know, that could well have been useful in the, you know, previous seven months of this pandemic, and I'm sure it can be useful as we go forward. So, uh, you know, how do we make sure that all of us who are, you know, in this arena actually have a comprehensive understanding um, of, of, of everybody else who's in there working on it? This reminds me of a positive flip on a old Rand reference that this, the power of the doomsday machine is that people need to know about the doomsday machine. But this is kind of a flip of a positive uh, mm -hmm. version of that. But maybe we should get the word out about this committee and, and try to find more ways to engage. I will, um, I'll welcome the opportunity to put in the chat um, some contact information. They do welcome outreach opportunities. And it's, um, it, it's just a great way to give uh, voice and visibility to efforts in the industry. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. This is what information sharing is what this session, these meetings are about. Um, next question comes from Captain David Moskoff. I thank you for the comment about the, the panel and discussions. Uh, it's a very specific question. Are there any national or regional plans to deal with sea level rise pertaining to critical height bridges where the clearance is already very tight for very large ships? The rising of the uh, the raising of the Bayonne Bridge in New Jersey upset the entire area for several years and was quite costly at many levels. I think I, I'd throw in there another one of this is... Too bad uh, Captain Smith is not a part of the bridge administration. He might, yeah. <laughs> but the, there's also, the for the inland waterways, there have been years where the opposite, lack of water has caused problems. It needed to be managed as well. So I think as, as water depths change, either in blue or brown water, we have this in both directions. Is this something that you all have confronted in in longer term port planning or, or waterway planning? I know that that topic does come up uh, often and probably I would say at every uh, ports and waterway safety assessment that we hold on a regular at least five year period in every port. Um, I, I can't speak to any kind of uh, regional or national approach 
Um, what I can say, though, is that uh, uh, the first time I really heard of resiliency being an issue or concern or uh, something that we need to take seriously uh, was for uh, sea, le sea level rise. So it's interesting how how that topic is certainly still uh, very relevant um, from a uh, from a resiliency standpoint. Well, it strikes me as this is a awesome risk assessment uh, project that could be done in cooperation with, you know, the bridge administration, the, the Coast Guard, DOT, and identifying those bridges that are getting close, right? If we predict so many inch rise uh, over, I don't know, the next 10 years, which bridges are those going to impact which waterways? And then take take a deeper look. Is is that what you're getting at uh, the question? Uh, whoever asked the question, Captain. Yeah, Captain. I asked the question. Yes, I asked the question, Aaron. And uh, uh, it's probably not a lot of bridges, but there are some ships that come very close to the bridges, and uh, uh, it's an issue. It, it's a, especially an issue on some bridges when it gets very very warm outside because some of the bridges sag quite a bit. Uh, the Verrazano Bridge sags almost a meter on hot, hot days, so it becomes. I know this, this general issue is a general engineering design issue, and, and I've run into it in my work in two ways. One is when we're thinking about even just floodproofing infrastructure. Uh, all the current flood maps tell us what the flood risk is today. There are no good federal certified flood maps for what the risk will be in 20 years, and that. And then, as a, in my old my old life, I was an, a design engineer for water wastewater, and you didn't want to, as a professional engineer, as many of you may know, make up what the standard is. You wanted to be able to go into some sort of state or federal guidebook to say, what is the design standard I'm supposed to design to? And for climate resilience, we are still developing that stuff. One of my colleagues, Costa Samaras at Carnegie Mellon in the Civil Engineering Department, is trying to come up with engineering-based science-based climate design standards. And I think this is a, you've given another example of one. And, and I, 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 if we had an Army Corps of Engineer person on this panel, I bet they would have something to say about it. Um, well, I don't want to take any, any more of your time, but I do uh, suggest if somebody contacts uh, the Bayonne folks, I think you're going to find it was an extremely costly project, very, very costly. And uh, when you stop the bridge traffic, you cut everybody off from being able to uh, go that route. There were tremendous, tremendous costs for that. So just mentioning it. And I think it links back into how we design the stuff, future stuff now, because what we design now may face some of these issues in the future. Oh, um, one comment for David, if I, if I could, Henry. Yeah, go for it, Aaron. So uh, we, we are seeing a lot of congressional marks and, uh, on uh, there's a lot of uh, communities that are questioning whether their ports are ready for sea level rise. And so uh, we do see this. There is a need for studies. I, I think our legislators understand that. It's just uh, maybe identifying the money and, you know, decoupling it from, you know, the, the current political rhetoric so that, you know, fruitful studies can be done on our most critical ports and what sea level rise will do to certain ports and then what a response would uh, have to be, or what preventative steps we could take. Uh, so, David, great, great, uh, great point. I think that is, uh, I, I would suggest a nice well, do out, do out for. I'm expecting that to see that in the R and D center's uh, R and D portfolio for next year, Joe. So you can, uh, we'll be looking for you to to step up to that. The uh, the next question, I think. Kevin Smith, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. I think you might be in one of the best places to do this, but you can deflect it away if, if, if I'm wrong. The uh, It's two questions, one from Steve Johnson and one from Joseph Myers. I'm going to put them together. Is there a published set of national standards for port to prepare for or guard against hostile terrorist attacks? And linked to that, are there existing security risk assessment tools for that or being combined into all hazards risk assessment? 
Yeah, yeah, there certainly are. Um, uh, uh, answering the first question regards uh, national standards or even regional standards, uh, every port has an area maritime security plan. Uh, within that plan, there's several annexes. Those annexes do include things like uh, hostile ter terrorist attacks as well as uh, active shooter, things like that. Uh, and then from a Coast Guard perspective, how we utilize our resources is is all is right now all risk-based. We, uh, we bring, t take in um, intelligence as well as um, uh, high degrees of risk, and we evaluate that and, and allocate our resources based on that risk. So um, uh, anyone else on the panel that might want to be able to add to that, I mean, without getting into any, any kind of uh, sensitive information, uh, the, b both those uh, issues are, are explored. And certainly there's probably a lot of room for additional um, exploration and in development, but right now we uh, we do have plans in place and we do use utilize risk-based tools to allocate our resources. So uh, just to comment on that, absolutely uh, agree with Captain Smith. I think the, the trouble is, is the subordinate plans below that. And so uh, you may have this large port plan, but then does it actually trickle down to the facilities, do uh, some of the critical infrastructure within the port? Do they have a good plan? Because it could be a single point of failure. Uh, we identified, you know, one ship in the MTS uh, has a problem, doesn't follow the regulation, or it engages in some risk that uh, will impact the entire entire port that was that was highlighted. Yeah, Aaron, I think that that that, that concern can be uh, uh, spread across all the different risks, and whether it's uh, uh, and, uh, one, one ship doesn't have a, a an active um, a pollution plan or an act or, or an active hurricane plan is not departing the port when when asked to. Uh, all those pose to be not only, as I mentioned in my remarks not only a risk to that particular entity, whether that particular facility or that particular vessel, uh, more concerning is the, the risk that, that that incident that could amount uh, could be created from that is, is the risk that it poses to the, the broader port. All right, I wanna close, we have about four minutes. I wanna close with a lightning round. Um, and I'm gonna steal the, this question. It's inspired by our colleague, Fred Roberts, who is, is in the participation, Fred Roberts from Rutgers. Uh, and that is, what problems is it, can the academic and broader research community answer to help the maritime sector improve resilience to disaster? So this is your chance to send us off all on our way. Uh, and I guess, Aaron, for you to kind of self-task yourself on this issue. Um, do more research and publish. Host dialogue with first responders, industry, regulators, operators, policymakers, planners, and don't forget the community in which you are trying to impose this in. Thank you. Any uh, needs you want to send us off with, Jennifer or Captain Smith? Absolutely. So how do we optimize communications and ensure a cohesive response across multiple uh, levels and jurisdiction? How do we ensure coherent, federally-led, unified response that allows the flexibility to address local variations? And then second, I'm thinking that this COVID experience is going to provide some sort of rich food for research on the difference between a short-term acute crisis like a hurricane, where we've got the ability to shut down, we shut we're at port conditions, Zulu, you know, for now, we're going to just stop uh, as opposed to COVID, which is a drawn out crisis where we're going to have to mitigate the impacts even as we're dealing with it. Is this a continuum? Is there a set of tools that make sense here, but not there? I think there's a lot to be learned there. That's great. Uh, Captain Smith, you get the last word. Okay. Well, uh, I think there's been some great topics that were brought up throughout this entire session, certainly by the last two speakers with that last response. Uh, I'll add to this kind of some IT tools, particularly from a Coast Guard perspective, uh, that are that are common, not just to the Coast Guard, but also to industry. So we're all talking from the from the same kind of a playbook. Uh, Risk-based decision-making, again, with that IT uh, concept, uh, the value of mobility and being able to utilize that and operationalize that, not just at the incident, man incident command post, but also out in the field. And uh, in doing all that without introducing any additional security um, or risk of overcomplicating uh, information. That's a great, that's a great suggestion. All right, well, with that, I would like to uh, thank our audience for uh, very active participation. And of course, our speakers for taking the time to share their ideas with us. Um, 
accomplish the goals of the the session and thank you all for for participating.